everybody, and welcome to the PT on Nice Daily Show. Christina Previtt here. I am one of two lead faculty in modern management of the older adult. Um, I teach the Essential Foundations Advanced Concepts and Live version of MMOA with Dustin Jones, who you see uh, on the podcast with me a lot. Uh, I hope you guys are having a wonderful, wonderful week. It is this crazy busy time of year in December. And it's also cold season, so I'm going to apologize in advance. My daughter and myself have been sick for the last week or so, and I swear I used to be this person that never, ever got sick until I had a daughter. And she's not even in daycare yet, but she's in the gym a lot. And so I'm hoping and praying that this is like her daycare year where she's getting all the germs from the gym so that um, this is like our year to get sick. But um, I digress. So if you heard me sniffling, I'm really sorry. I'm going to try and not do that on the audio, especially. Um, but I'm going to try and, you know, keep it under wraps. So I hope you guys have were able to see the announcement last week. So Dustin announced on the podcast and then we went live on Wednesday night about advanced concepts. We are super excited to be building out the second course. And while we are doing that with the second course, um, I get to get a little bit more updated on some of the literature. So kind of like we mentioned with advanced concepts, we're going to be building out units so that we're gonna take what we learned in the first course and then apply it to specific populations. One of that being um, different neurological populations, which is why you've been seeing me get on the podcast a little bit around neural rehab. And it's really funny because as I started going back, you know, we learn the basics in PT school around some of the pathophysiology of different neurological conditions. I actually had a neuroscience uh, undergraduate degree. And so I, I knew a lot of that, but going back and looking at some of the research, it's amazing how much has actually changed, including uh, on some of the basics that we didn't really realize was subject to change. And I really thought about that a lot with multiple sclerosis. So I treat individuals with MS that are in various degrees or various lengths of time since their initial diagnosis. And so I thought I kind of knew the basics of working with somebody with MS. But as I started going back into some of the original clinical research and what we now know about what is happening from an underlying disease process, I realize that there's been a lot that even in the last five years has really upped our knowledge game and it has implications for us as physical therapists in regards to how we're working with individuals with MS. So for the basic definition of MS, it's a chronic progressive neurological condition that is actually a T cell mediated autoimmune disease. So unlike other neurological conditions like Parkinson's, Huntington's and ALS, which is kind of in the brain like uh, completely with uh, MS, it's an autoimmune condition. So because of that, it's our immune system that is attacking a specific part of our body. So it's organ specific. In the case of MS, when we are thinking about what is being essentially attacked by our own immune system, it is the myelin or the insulation around the nerves. So the way that our nerves transmit to one another is through neurological synapses, but it's often the axon that is connecting to another neuron. And in that, um, it helps with the, the length of the, or the speed at which the signal is going from one neuron to the other, and that gets impacted with individuals with MS. And so coming back to neural basics, if we're thinking about what the cells are called, I always did Spock. So the Schwann cells uh, are the myelin cells that are around the peripheral nervous system and oligodendrocytes are around the central nervous system. So I think you guys will never forget that if you take nothing else from this podcast. Think Spock when we're thinking about what the myelin cells are in different parts of the central and peripheral nervous system. Um, but when we have somebody with MS, uh, it can happen in one of two ways. And so MS is actually a spectrum condition. Both are autoimmune, but it can present as relapse remitting MS or primary progressive MS and relapse remitting MS can uh, transition into secondary progressive MS. And so why is this important? And it's because one, it's going to change our medical management. 
Two, it's going to be able to give us a little bit of a better understanding of what our prognosis is going to be for the person that we're working with. It can also set us up as PTs for what our expectations are in regards to amount of functional recovery that a person that you're working with may be able to achieve. So if you're experiencing something called re relapse remitting MS, it means that you're gonna go through periods of time that are usually at least a month apart where a person is going to have an exacerbation of symptoms. And one of the reasons why MS can be challenging for us to research even is because myelin is present in various aspects of the brain, various aspects of our central nervous system. And because of that, no two people are going to present completely identically when they are presenting with symptoms of MS. And so when we're thinking about the initial diagnosis, usually we have something called CIS or clinically um, individual syndrome. I'm totally blanking on the I. And, or sorry, clinically isolated syndrome. There it is, <laughs> brain fart in the morning. Um, but what it means is, is that you're experiencing one type of neurological syndrome, usually in isolation for your first essentially relapse that may think to a neurologist or think to your primary care physician that there might be something going on neurologically. And so having that CIS and then having a secondary episode may cause us to trigger into a care pathway that may allow um, neurologists to run some tests to try and see if there is um, any underlying autoimmune conditions going on that may be indicative of MS. So if you have relapse remitting MS, usually within 15 years of diagnosis, half of individuals with MS are going to be having some sort of assistive device. So using some sort of gate aid to get around in terms of the degree of progression of motor impairment. Um, that being said, with some of the changes with medical management of MS, we have a ton that has happened in the last even five years that has allowed MS for prolonged periods of time to have periods that's called NIDA. And NIDA is no evidence of disease activity. One of the uh, popular stories where this has happened a lot is in HIV treatment, where people now a lot of times don't progress to AIDS and are actually what they're called living with HIV because they have NIDA, no, ev no evidence of disease activity. And so if you have an individual with relapse remitting MS, they had that CIS, they went through, got a blood panel done, was shown uh, to have some of the, the markers for autoimmune activity as well as some of the potential lesions on MRI, then they are gonna have potentially relapse remitting MS. And so at the very beginning of the disease process, Oftentimes people will go through these relapses where they'll have an exacerbation of symptoms. Sometimes they will seek treatment from a physical therapist to try and optimize their functional recovery and accelerate their, um, their recovery in regards to slow, um, the du duration of time in which a relapse will be present and then they will come down. So usually um, for a couple of the relapses at least, you can get back to completely um, quote unquote normal or where that person was prior to the relapse in regards to functional activity. Over time, there can be what's called like neurological um, deficits that have stayed behind or almost like this like hangover of neurological deficits that it can accumulate over time. So you may get a person who comes back to 95% of where they were, uh, still a 5% impairment, and they can manage with that for quite a few different relapses, but eventually that amount of neurological deficit accumulates and it, it translates into more permanent disability. For some individuals, relapse remitting can transfer into a secondary progressive MS, which means that they started in a, a relapse remitting type of pattern where you're going through this cyclical movements of having an increase in neurological symptoms and then going back to uh, no evidence of disease activity, but then it can a uh, switch can change and you go from the spectrum of inflammatory dominant to neurodegeneration dominant on the spectrum of MS and you can start not getting that same, those same um, in-between periods where you're going back to a more baseline level of neurological function. So when I say that MS is a spectrum condition, what we now know is that the majority of individuals are going to be diagnosed with relapse remitting. Only 10 to 15% are primary progressive MS. 
But when we're thinking about relapse remitting MS, we're thinking that it's an inflammation dominant. So that autoimmune condition is contributing to neuroinflammation, which is affecting the integrity of the myelin around the axons of the neurons. And then from there, it's transferring for individuals with uh, primary progressive MS, they're going to the other side of the spectrum where some of that neurodegeneration, those lesions that are present on MRI, when we're, especially for somebody who's had disease activity for quite some time, that neurodegeneration dominant is going to be uh, the reason why people are starting to experience uh, an accumulation of neurological deficits rather than this up and down in cyclical motion. Some of the cool things that are coming with MS is that because we know that there's this spectrum now between relapse remitting and primary progressive, these subtypes of MS, it's changing the way that our medical management is being applied. And so when we're thinking about the inflammatory dominant, we're thinking that our medication categories are going to be immunomodulatory. So we're going to have periods of time where we're going to try and bring down the immune system we're gonna modulate the output of the immune system and that's gonna be a way for us to try and mitigate some of the symptoms. The physician or neurologist that is working with this individual is going to be placing them on episodes of immunomodulation as well as different kind of baseline uh, uh, medications that are going to try and preserve NIDA for as long as possible. What happens when people transfer over into that neurodegeneration dominant is that sometimes the medical management is going to change into a purely immunosuppressive type of management to try and monitor some of the symptoms and try and slow down the rate of decline for individuals in this category of MS. And so as a PT, knowing what some of these new medications are is gonna be really important. And knowing kind of what our clients' different, um, different spikes with their relapse and remitting, where it usually affects, is it affecting the same way every time they have a relapse? What is their expectation of functional recovery is going to be really, really important. The last thing I'm gonna mention when it comes to research in MS is because the way that MS presents is so different, people can have sensory issues or primarily motor or primarily speech or memory, et cetera, et cetera, because of the way that the brain is you know, structured, the infrastructure of the brain, we have sometimes a harder time in regards to looking at some of the research because everyone is going to be slightly different, which is okay. That's just the nature of MS, but it means that I haven't been able to find as many high quality studies for rehab with multiple sclerosis as I was able to for Parkinson's. And so what the general consensus in the literature is showing is that from a neurological perspective, because of the way that MS is presenting, the a way that exercise and rehab will work is not necessarily to slow down disease progression, for example, and it is more related to being able to optimize function for the way that the person is or where the person is in that state. So if you're going through a relapse, then PT may help to optimize function. If you're in more of an accumulation of neurological deficits, you're gonna try and optimize the amount of function that a person will have. And then eventually after that optimization has been almost capped out or maxed out, we're probably looking more at a compensation type of model. All right, I hope you guys found that helpful. Going back to basics has been really, really great for me to you know, remember what my neuroanatomy is, remember what the mechanisms behind some of my rehab is when I'm working with somebody with MS, to understand what my expectations are for somebody depending on where they're at in the disease process, what their relapses and remittances look like, if they're transitioning into a primary progressive, what does that look like? Why challenging my beliefs in thinking that, you know, exercise is the end all be all for everything versus how can we just optimize a person's function where they're at? And then potentially, um, if you've had some sort of, uh, if you've had MS for a long period of time, maybe it's time for us to compensate and challenging my own biases. So I hope you guys found that helpful. Um, I'm still I'm going to be coming and kind of thinking through some of the material of advanced concepts on the podcast. It's one of the great ways of having this platform. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, comments, things that you really want to know about, put them in the comments. Um, I'll be monitoring them all day. And other than that, I hope you guys had a wonderful Wednesday. I didn't have too many of the sniffles. If you are looking at getting involved with um, either our Essential Foundations, which is starting January 6th, or our advanced concepts, which is starting March 
16th, I believe. I, I think I butchered that date, but it's starting in March. Make sure you get onto those um, those courses. The inaugural course of Advanced Cosmos is definitely going to fill up fast. So I hope that you guys um, will jump in on those. Other than that, have a great week. I will see you all on Friday where I switch hats and I talk about pregnancy and postpartum. Bye, guys. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the PT on Ice Daily Show. If you enjoyed this content, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. And be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram at the Institute of Clinical Excellence. If you're interested in getting plugged into more ICE content on a weekly basis while earning CEUs from home, check out our virtual ICE online mentorship program at ptonice.com. While you're there, sign up for our Hump Day Hustling newsletter for a free email every Wednesday morning with our top five research articles and social media posts that we think are worth reading. Head over to ptonice.com and scroll to the bottom of the page to sign up.